All right, we are back for another episode, and we are here on Subspace Odyssey Radio. I'm back with the professor, and we decided we're going to do a show that we're, it's going to be so much information that it's going to be overwhelming, but we're going to do, try to do our best to, to make sure that we keep it under control. So today, we are going to be talking about Skinwalker Ranch. I know it's a big topic out there. A lot of people are talking about it. Uh, but the professor here has been following this for a long time, and he wants to break down what he's got and, and talk about this. Hey, how's it going there, professor? Hey, Sage. Uh, how you doing, man? I, I'm, I'm doing all right. Uh, trying to uh, recover from all of this, uh, this research into this one. Yeah, you went, oh, MIA. You, you went MIA for a little bit. I thought maybe you were, it, were you know, gone there. This was this much research. Because this was, we're at a point now where we're doing uh, so much, so, some of these stories we're going to have to hide down here in the bunker. So we've moved from the office and I'm down here in the bunker and uh, we're going to be uh, talking about this one. But you did a lot of research on this one. A lot. Well, I've been interested in uh, Skinwalker Ranch since at least about 2007. So uh, a couple of years after the book was written um, by um, Colm Kelleher and uh, George Knapp, The uh, Hunt for the Skinwalker. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard all kinds of stories from George Knapp um, where he would get up in conferences and talk about some of the things that would happen, some of the things he experienced. And right. uh, um, I was just absolutely fascinated. And then, you know, when the show came out, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, here we go. <laughs> well, what, what's what's this going to, well, you know, what's going to happen with these guys? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let, I guess let's get right yeah, to it. Yeah, start, um, start, start, go ahead and start it off. So, for people who don't know um, anything about Skinwalker Ranch, it's a 512-acre uh, ranching property in uh, northeast Utah in the Uinta Basin. Mm-hmm. Um, this is kind of uh, close to the um, Wyoming and, and Colorado border. Um, the property is, it, it has a 100 foot high or roughly 100 foot high mesa in the northern region spanning the length of the property. Um, there are two creeks that run through the ranch. Um, there is a main road that runs through the ranch that connects the highway uh, from the east and, and connects to the highway to the west. And uh, one of the creeks follows along this road. Just kind of giving you a geography thing here. Um, to the south, there is an area that the current owners call the Serengeti, just because it kind of looks like that. Okay. Um, which there's a there's a creek that runs down in there. Um, there are three homesteads on the property, two of which have been abandoned since I believe the the 30s. Um, I think there were actually Native Americans living in those two uh, back then before the Myers family acquired the property. Um, and there's what appears to be an old mine that's located across from, uh, from the main road across from Homestead 2. Um, that's just my, I, 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 I don't know how I came to that conclusion. It, it just looks like there's a mine there. Gotcha. Um, there's, uh, obviously it was, it was used as a cattle ranch for a very long time. So there's a field to the east, which butts up to Homestead 1, uh, which is where the, the command center and, um, the uh, the actual house where people lived, mm -hmm. um, and then there's a west field and kind of a center field. There's kind of two center fields there. Um, so let's talk about pre Skinwalker Ranch. So before it got famous, okay. So uh, Kenneth and Edith Myers were the ones that owned the property from 1934 to 1994, and uh, there was a lot of misinformation about this. Something something about like maybe they acquired it. In fifties or somehow it exchanged hands or something like that. Um, but no, they owned the property, uh, from 1934 to 1994. Kenneth Myers passed away in 1986 and his wife, Edith Myers stayed on the property with her small dog until I believe, um, someone said she had passed away in 1987. And the other story is that she moved to an assisted living home in 1987. Gotcha. So between 1987 and 1994, um, the property was vacant. Okay. Um, and it had been a cattle ranch for, for the longest time. Even when Edith Myers was staying there, they, they still rented it out. And uh, Kenneth's brother, Garth Myers, was the one that kind of took care of the property. Um, and he's the one that actually handled the property and its purchase by Terry Sherman in 1994. Okay. So... Um, 
And this is according to Garth Myers. Um, I guess after everything that had happened, uh, he was he was um, interviewed and he said, quote, nothing unequivocally. Um, absolutely nothing peculiar occurred. So he claims that nothing happened. There was right. no weirdness happening. No weirdness. Um, Got it. Despite despite the history of the Uinta Basin, which is um, spans, I mean, it it goes back to at least the 1950s with UFO sightings and reports. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of lots of weird stuff that happened so, um, in the Uinta Basin. I mean, going all the way back then, and um, I also want to talk about the history of of where the name Skinwalker came from. Okay. Um, for Skinwalker Ranch, and this has to do. Th- this goes back a, a really long way um, in my studies, and th- this goes back at least uh, a thousand years ago. Okay. So we're talking a thousand years ago, and this this story comes from the Navajo oral, oral tradition. So uh, according to them, uh, they moved from the east to the west to the Four Corners region, which is Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. Okay. Where, where they all meet, the Four Corners region. And they said when they got there, there were um, multiple groups of Native Americans living there, um, including the, the Ute tribe and the Pueblo, which were the ones who were living in the, uh, the cliffside dwellings, um, mm-hmm. if you're familiar with those. Yeah. Um, when they got there and saw that, they, they kind of, you know, they, they set up camp and... Uh, they kind of looked at the Pueblo and they were like, hey, well, what are you guys doing way up there? Why don't you come down here with us and hang out? You know, we, we, we don't bite. And uh, so they did. And they lived peacefully in this, this coexistence for about 100 years. <clears throat> During that 100-year spam, they said a group from the south moved in. And this was the Anasazi. Now... A lot of people have misconceptions about the Anasazi. And of course, this comes from like ancient aliens and, and all of this other stuff. Like, you know, what happened to the Anasazi? Where did they go? What right. did they do? They thought they were the ones that built the cliff dwellings and all of this stuff. Well, the Navajo say, no, it's, that's not how it went. What happened was, is they moved up from the south and they called them Anasazi because the word means people who do things differently. Okay. They said that uh, these people worship darkness. They were very strange. They they were not at first they were peaceful. Um, they just kind of did their stuff, you know, they they kind of kept to themselves. But eventually they kind of went out and started kidnapping all of these different tribes and keeping them as slaves. Mm. And they would uh they would enslave these people and have them build some of these a lot of the structures that are down there. There's like a whole complex down there. The Navajo claimed that was all slave labor that built that. And this was the Anasazi that 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 uh, conducted this slave. In fact, it wasn't even a trade. They just kept them and and made them work for them. Right. And I I, I make the uh, assumption that uh, just like the Hebrews who were kept in captivity in Babylon, who kind of uh, adopted the stories of Babylon um, into their own culture as they moved on, and of course the same thing happened in Egypt. Uh, the Navajo and the Utes kind of did the same thing. So they were in captivity by the Anasazi. They were witness to all these weird rituals and rites that they would do. Um, they were engaged in black magic, all kinds of weird stuff. Um, well, eventually, the Navajo, they, they all got together and they were like, okay, we've had enough of this. And they had a war with the Anasazi. And they were able to uh, uh, push these large boulders off the mountainsides and, and break up all of these these. Uh, Prisons, essentially, is what they were. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they, they had a big war with the Anasazi, and they killed them all. So that's, what, that's the story from the Navajo of the Anasazi. Wow. So okay. when we get into uh, Skinwalker Ranch, there was – what happened was as soon as um, the Utes got a hold of, of horses and rifles and, and all of these things from the, the settlers, they started doing the same thing to the Navajo. They started uh, capturing them, enslaving them, and, and, and selling them off in a slave trade in New Mexico. And, of course, they got sick and tired of this. And so the Navajo kind of you know, uh, went to the dark side, so to speak, <laughs> to try to take care of their problem mm-hmm. and uh, started conducting some of this black magic that they had learned from the Anasazi. Now, that, that's, that's, that's what I believe okay. happened. 
And so when we talk about a skinwalker, what that is, is a Native American witch who has gone through a certain rite of passage, which is not something anybody would ever want to do. Um, but like I said, I guess they were desperate enough to do this. Um, and what they do is, is they wear the skin of different animals and, you know, call it black magic, whatever you want. But somehow they, they can, can uh, um, project a powerful suggestion to other people that makes them look like an animal. Okay. okay. So that's kind of that's that's kind of the story of 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 the skinwalker and, and what all that is. And and according to, to uh and according to the Ute tribe, this is uh the the ranch is in the path of the skinwalker. So apparently this this happened around here. And there's a rumor um that to this day they exist and live or hang out in what's called the uh, Dark Canyon, which is located about 25 miles north of the property. Um, so I, I don't know what, what kind of truth is in that, but that's, that's kind of the rumor. Right, right. So this is the, that's kind of the backstory of the Skinwalker um, and a little bit of the area and, and basically why it's called Skinwalker Ranch. And then we have the, the owners who own it, uh, 87, nothing, and then till 94, nothing happened. And allegedly, nothing to see here. Move along, move along. Uh, Greg Myers basically said nothing happened, even though there was other stuff that was happening in that area, correct? Well, it's been said that it's possible that Garth Myers didn't know um, or wasn't told about anything that happened to the okay. ranch. Like I said, he was a caretaker, so he, wasn't, he didn't live there. He wasn't always there. You know, maybe the family saw weird things and just didn't tell him. Right. Um, we'll give him that benefit. That, out. That, yeah, that's possible. It's also possible that they didn't want, they, they, they were trying to get rid of the property and they didn't want to cause any controversy over the property and, right. and, and ruin any cell. So that's another possibility because okay. one of the claims that, uh, well, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get All into right. that. Okay. So, um, so the, um, the Sherman family buys the property, um, towards the fall of 1994. Mm -hmm. And so they're moving in, and uh, as they're moving in, um, Terry, who's, who's – there's Terry Sherman, there's Gwen Sherman, and they have a son. Um, Terry spots a large wolf closing in on the family um, at a distance from one of the fields. Okay. And so the family sits there, and they're, they're watching silently as this gray wolf, uh, they claim, three times larger than any wolf they had ever seen, uh, just sits down about 50 yards away. And it just looks at him. Okay. And it appeared completely tame as it approached the family, looking to make contact. Um, as it approached Terry, who was six feet tall, the animal's head reached almost to his chest. So that is a very, very, very large animal. Yeah, it's a, that's sitting. Yeah, that's a big, big dog. That's a big wolf. Go ahead. Terry also noticed that it had massive muscles beneath its gray coat, and its eyes were a shade of light blue. So this kind of harkens back to um, the uh, um, Dogman Dog episode that we did. Yeah, sure does. Um, so it, it definitely kind of appears that way. Mm -hmm. And so Terry had just unloaded uh, some of his prize calves in a nearby corral. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them was curious enough that it had pushed its head through the bars. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it did that, they saw a swift bound from this wolf um, as it grabbed the calf in its jaws. Okay. They said it did this with unbelievable speed. Um, so Terry quickly sprang into action. He grabbed a baseball bat that was that was uh, that he, in, in some of the stuff that he was unloading. Mm -hmm. um, and he just starts wailing at this thing. And it would not let go of this calf. So hmm. uh, Terry's son grabs this 357 Magnum. Um, um, and Terry fires two shots into the wolf with no effect. And and that's no small cartridge. That's yeah. That's, 357 is go ahead, make my day situation. That it is not yes. a small <laughs> firearm. Exactly. Just so you know. So on the third shot, the wolf released the calf and kind of stood back nonchalantly as if nothing really happened. Yeah. Um, so Terry fires a fourth shot into the wolf's heart at 10 feet away. And so it backs off another 30 feet. Mm -hmm. The wolf kind of looked back at the corral as if it was thinking about attacking again. And so Terry asked his son to get his 30 odd 6 Okay. Now, anybody who's not a gun person, a 30 odd 6 is a very 
um, it's 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 kind of your your go to cartridge for just about anything. Yeah, um, it's a large you, you, round. Uh, you can honest. hunt just about anything with a thirty odd six. Correct. <clears throat> Um, so Terry aims for the chest cavity and fires, and a sizable chunk of flesh rips off the animal in the exit wound. Um, and the wolf kind of trotted off as if this wasn't a big deal. Um, so Terry and his son follow in pursuit because they they can't have this thing, you know, doing what it's doing. It's it's a problem. We got to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. So they they chase after this thing, and about a mile after tracking this wolf, uh, the tracks in the mud just kind of stop dead as if it vanished. Um, they reached a point, they looked down, they saw tracks, they looked up, there were no tracks, and they couldn't figure out what happened to this thing. Hmm. So okay. that was the first strange instance that happened as soon as they got on the property. In, in, in other words, the day of. Hmm. Now, what's interesting about this story is that I read a story that, um, you know, after the book had come out, um, Terry was interviewed, and he claimed that this story wasn't exactly true. Mm, did he now? But the problem is, is he didn't, you know, he didn't iterate what part of it wasn't true. So we don't know. And I, I think that um, it, it was Colin Kelleher and George Knapp who kind of uh, wrote the story out, I think, from memory. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it may be a small detail that they missed or, or something that they added in. We, we don't know. But there was some controversy between this story and what Terry Sherman actually had to say about the story after it was written. Okay. Um, so I found that interesting, but it but it's important to note um, controversy is is rampant when it comes to Skinwalker Ranch. That yeah. is that is an important thing to understand. So um, in in my studies, I you know coming across that some of this stuff may be incorrect. Okay. Um, some of this stuff may be correct. Mm-hmm. It's just that there are so many different stories and different sides who have said so many things. I think a lot of it just has – I think a lot of it comes down to details, I think. Okay. So anyway, moving on to Homestead 1, and this is where we have um, kind of an issue with what uh, Garth had to say about the property having nothing going on and what the Shermans had to say about mm-hmm. what they saw when they got there. Now, obviously, it had been, it, it'd been sitting there dormant for – Quite a few years before they bought it, so it was right. kind of a fixer-upper. Um, but they were baffled and unnerved at the fact that every door on this house had several large, heavy-duty deadbolts on both the inside and outside of the doors. Okay, so inside meaning if they left the house, it had deadbolts that were different than the ones coming in, like both sides of the door? Yes, so it would be those 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 uh, surface mount deadbolts, not the ones that you see in normal houses that are you know on okay. the inside of the door. So they've been on like the outside, but like, both the inside okay. and the outside, they had these deadbolts, which is extremely odd. Yeah, extremely odd because you know I can completely understand having the deadbolts on the inside. Obviously, right. that's to keep people from getting in. But why would you keep something from getting out? Yeah, <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, it's like it, you got to wonder what what was going on there. Um, all of the windows were also bolted. Um, each end of the homestead had large metal chains that were attached to large steel rings embedded into the wall as if they had guard dogs out there on them. Okay. And, you know, according to Garth, uh, Edith had a, had one small dog. That was it, right. according to him. So w- what was this all about? Yeah, nothing. It was can, just kind of strange. Nothing you can contain with a, a regular leash and, you know, assortment of, you know, thing. You didn't need these big you know, things to contain, right? A smaller dog. Right. Yeah. Right. So okay. it's, it's, you know, curiosity, it definitely w- w- with regards to that. So, mm-hmm. and, and another strange thing was the real estate contract had a strange clause built in that there would be no digging without prior warning to the previous owners. So no digging unless the previous owners who have passed away, correct? At this point? Uh, yeah. So, well, um, I guess... Let's see. I, I guess uh, Garth Myers would have been the last person to be, you know, I guess have somewhat ownership or, or something of the property. I don't know if he actually owned it, um, if he if he got that from Edith Myers, because like I said, I, we're uh, we're kind of unsure when Edith Myers passed away, if this was in 1987 or later after she had moved to an assisted living home. But either way, uh, Garth Myers lived until 2011. So I assume it was him. So even if it was him, once he passed away, are you telling me that they're not nobody's allowed to dig because you can't inform the previous owners? 
Right. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, okay. There's a couple of theories uh, rolling around about this. You know, yeah. one of them is is the is the mainstream theory of of bad things happen when you dig, and we'll kind of get into that. True. Um, but another theory was, well, maybe there was some kind of family treasure mm-hmm. on the property somewhere. Maybe um, another thing was somebody had brought up mineral rights. Perhaps Terry Sherman did not buy the mineral rights for the property, but owned the property. Right. Um, maybe that had something to do with it. Because, like I said, I, there appears to be a mine on the property. So, mm-hmm. who knows? Who right. knows? Really? Yeah. Hmm. That's still interesting. Okay. No digging without prior warning Warning to the previous owners. Got it. All right. Very strange. So uh, we, we get to the story of the wolf part two. Um, so Gwen Sherman, this is, this is Terry's wife. She yeah. was headed home from work. And as she opened the gate, she noticed movement out of the corner of her eye. And the wolf that they had witnessed previously began to approach her car. So she jumps in. Um, and she saw it standing outside her window, and its head stood over the roof of her car. Um, and then, of course, shortly after that, she guns it and heads home and hides in the house, basically. Yeah, I can <laughs> What see anybody that. else would do. Uh, but the interesting thing is that locals had seen it and claimed that there was a pack of them in the area, which is interesting. Wow. So it's not something that, you know, just the Shermans saw. This was something that a lot of the locals in the area saw as well. Hmm. Okay. And a pack. So, not just one, a pack. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. So now we get to some of the strange activity that was happening. So we get to some poltergeist activity that was happening on the property. So um, one night, Gwen Sherman was walking along the ridge. Uh, well, it was one evening, so I assume yeah. sunset. Uh, when she felt something large swoop out of the sky near her, she said it was so large that she could feel the, the turbulence from the, from the air. Something, something pretty significant up there. Yeah. And uh, she never saw it. Never, never saw anything. Um, so that was the first kind of weird thing. But she, she kind of said, well, you know, maybe it was a bird and it just flew off so quick I couldn't see it. Mm-hmm. But then stuff like this would happen. She would leave utensils out on the table. She would return and they'd be missing. Um, one day she came home. She uh, had just gotten done grocery shopping and, and when you live on a ranch like this you, you're pretty far away from everything so you you kind of do your monthly grocery shopping right yeah yeah <clears throat> so you grab a lot of stuff you, you got a lot of stuff to put away and so she has all these bags on the table and she's putting it up in the pantry and uh she she leaves the room and comes back and finds all of the stuff that she'd put in the pantry back in the bag on the table weird and and at this point she's i mean she's she didn't think she put it away, didn't she? She's not like losing it at this point, right? I mean, she's still mentally all together, all there. Well, according to her, she started questioning questioning herself and what was going on because really? of how weird the thing. And any anybody would, yeah, of course, absolutely. Because you know, she would you know take a shower. She would get out, and the towel that was sitting there waiting for her would be missing. Um, and you know, did you know she would go in there, lock the door, take a shower, get out. You know, who got in and took this towel? Right. Um, and then Terry, one day, he was working on fixing one of the fences when his 70-pound post digger yeah. disappears along with his pliers. Now, this isn't your normal, you know, like post hole, hand, hand dug post hole diggers. This this is a, a pretty big rig, you know, this wheeled, um, has a has a big corkscrew on it, motor. You got to crank it up and, and you know plow into the dirt to dig the post. So this isn't something somebody could just run off with. Yeah. You know, it would take a few people in a truck probably to take this thing off and disappear. That fast, and he eventually, yeah. uh, eventually like weeks after this thing went missing, they found it up in a tree. What? Up in a tree. In a tree. Okay. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. That's weird. So now you're taking a 70 pound thing and who's toting it up a tree. That's, right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, one day, Terry's nephew visited the ranch. And uh, one evening, uh, Terry, his son, and his nephew, they were kind of sitting out, um, you know, just kind of watching the sunset. And they noticed what looked like an RV out in the distance, um, about a half mile away. And I, they, could uh, see, you know, they could see the headlights and the taillights okay. as if they were looking at the side, right? Yeah, recreational vehicle type thing. Gotcha. All right. Yes, yes. Um, and... Um, 
so Terry, his son, and his nephews. So they went. They went to go run them off. They thought they were just people hanging out out there. Yeah. Um, and as they approached, it started moving away from them. And Terry's kind of puzzled. He's like, "How, how could they see us? It's it's dark outside, and and we're still pretty far away from them. How 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 right. is this possible?" And they noticed. You know, as it was moving away, it didn't, you know, bounce over the terrain like a vehicle would. It, it, it was very smooth as it moved back. Okay. And so they kept chasing it. They kept chasing it. And they basically cornered it into this field where there, there was no way. If you're driving something that big or, or even any vehicle, you know, you're, you're not getting out of there. There's, there's, there's too many tree lines. Right. So he's like, well, surely they're not going to get away now. Well, then all of a sudden, it rose from the ground 50 feet up into the air and disappeared into the distance above the trees. And they claimed that it was in the shape of a refrigerator. Mm, okay, that's why they thought it was an RV. Okay. Yeah, so... The, after this, you know, Terry started realizing that there's some weird stuff going on. Yeah. And so... Terry kind of has this mindset of, of well, I'm going to try to figure out what this thing is. And what he would do is, is every night he would grab his gun, he would go out, and he would basically just kind of sneak around the property. Yeah. Um, you know, his mindset was that something was going on, and I want to find out who who's responsible for it. I'm going to catch him in the act, that sort of thing. Right. And that, so that, one night when he was doing this – sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so when one night when he was doing this, um, he noticed this this orange cloud that kind of loomed over the property, and he watched this kind of take shape, and he said that depending on the angle that you viewed it at, you might not be able to see it at all, but if you looked at another angle, it almost looked like a tunnel, an orange tunnel, and he said it, and eventually he saw daytime on the other side. And he said this 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 tunnel, whatever it was, was aimed directly at the homestead. And so, you know, this is this is one of those things. It was just like he, he could not figure out what he he knew something at this point. He definitely knew something was weird going on the ranch. So we I have mean, a tunnel which is basically looks to be two dimensional. Is that what he's saying? Rather than a, a three dimensional type aspect. I what? would say more I would say more holographic the way he explained okay. it because he said you could stand you know at a certain degree and it would just kind of disappear and then when you got in front of it you could see kind of a three-dimensional tunnel going in mm, okay with, all right with with clear daylight on the other side so you know he's trying to figure out what this is what what in the world is going on yeah that's interesting okay so one winter, uh, we'll we'll get into some of the, the the cow issues that he started having. One winter after a snowstorm, Terry climbed on his horse and he was looking for a missing cow. Yeah. Um. So he found tracks. Um. And, and he started tracking this animal, and he saw that the tracks appeared to go from a walk to a sprint. And he could see that it was it was going around bushes, it was running, it was dodging, it was doing all these things. And he was like, well, "What in this thing? What in the world is this thing running from? There aren't any other tracks. It's just this cow." Yeah. And so he traced it to a clearing where the tracks vanished along with the cow. In other words, he, the tracks went, they stopped, no cow, no more tracks, nothing. All right. So he didn't know what to think about this. So whatever. Later on, Go ahead. they started seeing these orbs going across. They, they started seeing these orbs floating across the property. Some of them were blue, some of them were yellow, some of them were orange. And they claimed they were about the th three times the size of a baseball. So not very big. Mm -hmm. They okay. appeared to be translucent, filled with some sort of, they were filled with some sort of fluid and gave off a crackling electrical sound as they came near. Mm -hmm. And they started noticing these things and they would regularly scare the cattle. And, and Terry claimed that they induced an artificial fear state that he witnessed for himself. In other words, he wasn't he wasn't fearful of these things until they got close, and all of a sudden he just started feeling this this weird fear that wasn't coming from him. Mm, um, okay. Now his wife Gwen discovered that they didn't like flashlights because every time she would come out and shine a flashlight on these things, they would zip off into the wood line and disappear. The orbs, the orbs didn't like flashlights. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, they also noticed as as they flew by the windows of the house, the lights would dim. And as they went away, the lights would come back on. 
which is very interesting. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So shortly after this, uh, Terry started noticing large bowls cut out of the ground around various parts of the property. Um, some of them were missing hundreds of pounds of soil. Um, they were pretty large. Um, some of them were kind of strange impressions into the ground. Some of these were like eight feet in diameter, you know, pretty big, um, which is just strange because there's no, I mean, <laughs> it's like, what in the world did that and why? It's, yeah. it's just a weird, weird thing to happen. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Things started getting weirder as Terry and his wife started hearing voices speaking an unfamiliar language above them in broad daylight out in the open. Um, they claimed that they sounded as if they were taunting and laughing at them. Hmm. So uh, when, is, when wandering around on the ranch, they would hear this or even in the house. They would just be outside, just out in the open, outside. maybe, you know, having a conversation out in the front of the house. And then all of a sudden they would hear this and look up trying to figure out what in the world is, is going on. They just appeared to come out of the sky. Hmm. But nothing was up there. They didn't see anything. Right. They just heard it. Right. Um, hmm. So the next strange thing that happened, um, we'll call this the predator. So one day a man drove up to the ranch and um, Terry and his son kind of came up like, you know, what do you want? And uh, he asked on the ranch. And of course, Terry and his son kind of smirk at each other and out of amusement, they were like, all right, all right, cool. So they escort, they, they escort the man a mile into the ranch. And uh, the man, you know, got out of the got out of the vehicle and he walked, you know, maybe 50, 60 feet into a field. And, uh, you know, he, he stood up with his hands outstretched and his eyes closed and, and Terry and his son are kind of making fun of him. And then suddenly Terry saw something break from the tree line, making a beeline towards the guy. And Terry couldn't make out what it was. He said it looked blurry as if hidden in a heat distortion. But he said it was very large. He said the it was shimmering, wraith-like, huge thing um, that had run up and it had stopped inches from this guy meditating. And it let out this loud roar that uh, Terry said sounded like half bear, half lion. But it was incredibly loud. He said it was loud enough that you could feel it through your body. Like it shook them to their core. It was so loud. Wow. And uh, this poor guy who was meditating leaped back like 10 feet, fell to the ground screaming hysterically. Um, and just as quick as it came in, this this creature left for the tree line and disappeared. And uh, so this guy was just screaming hysterically, grabbing Terry, you know, freaking out and and wanting to get out of there. So it comes whipping in from like heat distortion. And anybody, you know, driven um, drive track trailers times where the roads are so hot, you get that wavy distortion look um, off of the blacktop and stuff like that. It literally came in from something like that. Stopped in front of the guy, screamed like a bear slash lion in front of somebody that was basically somewhat meditating with their hands outstretched and their eyes closed. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. And later, later, Terry's, uh, you know, Terry and his family were watching the movie The Predator. And when they saw this, Terry was like, that was it. That's what we saw. Really? Yeah. He's like, that's exactly what we saw. Uh, yeah. So, a lot of other things happened, and I didn't include it simply because there's just not enough time to include all the strangeness that occurred with, with the, the Sherman family. But I will include this last one, which was the dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, one evening, Terry spotted one of these orbs in the distance at the far end of the pasture. And, you know, at this point, he was just kind of sick and tired of it. And so, he released yeah. three of his dogs, and they snarled and chased the blue orb. And, and, and uh, he noticed as they approached... The orb would drop close to the ground Mm -hmm. and the dogs would get close and they would snarl and snap at it and it would jump back up. Mm -hmm. It it was like it was teasing them. And he noticed that not only was it teasing them, but it looked like it was also luring them as it was doing this. So as as the orb lures the dogs into a tree line and out of sight and he he hears them yelp in mortal agony, according to him. Mm -hmm. And of course, it being night. And being Skinwalker Ranch, he's like, I'm going to leave this for the morning. So the next morning, Terry and his nephew went out there and found three large circles pressed into the ground. And in the center of these circles was a blackish, greasy mess and the horrible smell of incinerated dogs. All the hair. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, that would be that that would do it for me. Yeah, and and uh Terry's nephew has actually come back to the property on the show and talked about this story and talked about what they saw. Hmm. And okay. uh this this is where we we hear about you know he talks about the impressions in the ground. He said it was almost like a, a hot iron just got pressed down on these dogs into the ground and made these impressions. Um which is just absolutely strange. Yeah. So at this point, you know, the Sherman family knew they had to sell the ranch. Terry had had enough. He had lost so many cattle. Um, and the family, uh, his wife had lost his job. His son was getting bad grades in school. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't sleeping. They all had to resort to sleeping in the middle of the living room of the house. Um, it, it had just gotten really, really bad. So um, at this point, Terry went public. He went to uh, the Deseret News, mm -hmm. and he went to a guy by the name of Zach Van Eyck in June 30th of 1996. <clears throat> so the, after this, uh, the story spread like wildfire. Yeah. It really did. And uh, it had caught the attention of a guy by the name of Robert Bigelow. And uh, th this was only a few weeks after ha having gone public. So when we talk about Robert Bigelow, <clears throat> this is a Las Vegas real estate tycoon, mm -hmm. and he is he is one of those you know billionaire um, people who are interested in paranormal UFOs, all of that kind of stuff. So when he read about this, he was like, "Oh, here's my chance to have something you know that I can I can I can research right." Yeah. So he goes out there. Um, well, before I get to this, let, let's talk about some of the things that Robert Bigelow is into. Okay. He is the CEO of Bigelow Aerospace. And if you've never heard of Bigelow Aerospace, they have what's called the Genesis Program. And they have created what are, what are, they are um, these expandable habitats that they launch out into space. And it's, uh, you know, it, it comes, it, they, they launch it on top of a rocket and it's, it's all compact. Mm -hmm. And they launch it out into space and they expand it. And uh, there's about 410 square feet of space inside. It's like uh, got about an eight foot diameter, uh, 14 foot in length. Mm -hmm. And um, these were they have the Genesis one and Genesis two in orbit. Uh, Genesis one was launched in 2006. Genesis two uh, was launched in 2007. Um, and these are actually still up there. So you know the ISS is isn't the only space station up there. And, and of these course, were these were launched by uh, Russia, correct? Yes, yes. These were launched. Uh, Bigelow said that at the time, this was when the shuttle program was was winding down, and it became extremely expensive to launch anything in the United States. So mm -hmm. he had it launched uh, by the Russians um, using their uh, Nepper ICBMs, and this this happened at the Cosmodrome. And if you don't know what the Cosmodrome is, this is where Russia launches all of their stuff, and this is in uh, Kazakhstan. Right. So he had these two launched. Uh, there's a uh, what he calls a B330, which is a proposed habitat module for the ISS that hasn't hasn't come to fruition yet. Mm -hmm. um, and he also has something called the Beam, which was the first private expandable habitat that was actually attached to the ISS. Um, and this provides additional storage for the ISS. This is also kind of one of those things they're trying to figure out if it's you know what what's working, what's not, that sort of thing. And this yeah. was actually launched by the SpaceX Dragon capsule. Um, okay. So the and this is attached to the ISS currently, and they're using it for storage. Um, so Robert Bigelow is definitely into space. He is kind of the he's kind of the Elon Musk before Elon Musk came along and, gotcha. and did all that he did. Okay. Um, so in September of 1996, and this is three months after Terry Sherman went public, Robert Bigelow buys the property from him for two hundred thousand um, dollars. And now this is where we get into what I call the Bigelow era, uh, which is really the National Institute for Discovery Science era. Mm -hmm. Now, the National Institute for Discovery Science uh, was started by Robert Bigelow, and its purpose was to investigate paranormal topics. In other words, this is like, you know, where you have your, your paranormal researchers and your ghost hunters. This is like a professional version of that. Gotcha. This is the well, the well-funded version of that. Okay. And uh, they went on through from 1995 to 2004. And uh, Robert Bigelow was president and founder. Uh, a guy by the name of uh, Colm Kelleher was uh, the deputy administrator. Uh, they had a whole 
a science advisory board made up of all kinds of PhDs, medical doctors, uh, what have you. Uh, one of them was uh, John Alexander, which um, I, I believe he, he came onto the ranch on the show at some point. Mm -hmm. um, Edgar Mitchell, the uh, astronaut, the Apollo astronaut, mm -hmm. uh, I believe he walked on the moon. Um, and Jacques Vallée, who is the famous UFO researcher. Um, and a little side note about Jacques Vallée, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm -hmm. uh, the French guy that's in that movie, he's playing the character of Jacques Vallée. Oh, um, okay. Steven Spielberg uh, uh, respected Jacques Vallée, and when he made that movie, he kind of put them in, gave him a different name, right. but uh, put his character in there. So that's, that's who that is, really. Um, well, not the... Right, the, the, the actor that right. plays him, but that that character, that's Jacques Vallée. So, after buying the property and putting this team together, uh, Terry Sherman, kind of out of stubbornness, stayed as the ranch manager. He didn't like the idea of getting kicked off his ranch by something he couldn't figure out. He was right. just like, "This, I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, down and out that quick." Yeah. And he started talking with the NIDS team um, about their research, and he was talking about they should take the form. You know, their, their research should take the form of a hunt and be very low key because that's what he had been doing up to this point. You know, he was sneaking out at night. He, he would, uh, you know, crawl about the property. I mean, he would crawl on his on his, you know, hands and knees and very slowly and, and work his way around the property. And he claimed that whatever this this phenomena was, it wasn't omnipotent because he caught it a few times and he knew that it didn't see him. Mm. which is interesting yeah that's interesting yep okay so he's he's crawling around in, in the, you know probably a ghillie suit sniper gear and trying to stay hidden and seeing he can catch it off guard basically with this um i, I believe there was a large triangle ufo that hovered across uh, uh, hovered over the property that he was able to to catch kind of in the act because normally these things he would come out and they would just boom gone disappear yeah. or jet off or do whatever they do um but he was able to catch quite a few things um unfortunately not on camera uh but you know the uh the nids team th this was kind of awkward so for the nids team they had to fly back and forth from las vegas to conduct night watches so this was an everyday event they would fly from las vegas to utah Mm. And they would drive out to the ranch and they would spend all night investigating. And then in the morning, they would fly back, go back to their hotel rooms and sleep. Um, hmm. I, I, I don't I mean, I, I don't know why they would do. I guess I Bigelow know. probably I, this might have been cheaper for Bigelow. Maybe he had some properties there they were hanging out at. Maybe he had an airplane. Oh, you know, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But very, uh, very um, kind of difficult to uh, to do all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, this this was at the beginning. Later on, they would bring uh, um, you know campers onto the property and and kind of be a little bit more permanent. Right. The interesting thing about the NIDS team is that while they were conducting uh, their research on Skinwalker Ranch, there was another ranch that they conducted um, surveys and research on. Really, it's in Mount Wilson Ranch in Nevada. Um. Apparently, this is another Skinwalker Ranch type area. Everything that happened on Skinwalker Ranch has happened on Mount Wilson Ranch. Mm. And so, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I believe it was Jacques Vallée, Ellen, um, Colin Kelleher, and, and a couple other uh, of the science advisory boards, they, they went out there. And according to some of the rumors, they were doing, you know, I talked about the, the close encounters of the third kind. Mm -hmm. Apparently they were, if you remember at the end of the movie, when they had that, that, that elaborate setup where they had these, these big loudspeakers, they had lights, they had a runway, they had all this stuff set up yeah. and they were trying to contact and, and talk to the, the aliens or whatever. Apparently this exact same thing happened at Mount Wilson Ranch. Re really? So this was okay. And uh, there, there has been, um, th there's actually a video um, or several videos. Uh, what is it? Um, uh, Carl Crusher, I think. Yes, Carl Crusher. 
Yeah, yeah. He went out there and and did some research and talked to the owners, and they they talked about some of the stuff that would happen and some of the people that came out and some of the things that they did. So that's kind of where this story comes from. Mm. But it's just interesting to note that, uh, you know, Skinwalker Ranch wasn't the only one, and neither was Mount Wilson Ranch. Yeah. Um, the NITS team was all over the world, apparently. There were a lot of different hot spots that they would visit and study this stuff. Hmm. So um, we'll get into some of the uh, some of the events that happened during this. Like I said, I can't cover everything because there's just so much weird stuff that happened. Yeah. Um, uh, but in March of 1997, uh, Terry was out tagging a calf, and uh, about 45 was found mutilated. 45 minutes later. 45 minutes later, literally, he had walked from tagging this calf to another field, turned around, and the calf was gone. And when they went searching for it, they finally found it, and it had been mut- it, it was it was one of those kind of classic like splayed out like a science yeah. project. Yeah, no blood, uh, all the internal organs were missing. You know, the whole nine yards. Um, yeah. when um, the, let's see, uh, one night the dogs alerted to something, and the teams kind of went out uh, to see what what they were freaking out about, and uh, they ran across. A large animal with large yellow eyes in a tree. And so uh, Terry took a shot at it and the eyes disappeared. And mm-hmm. so Terry thought he had hit it. And so they went kind of around the ground of the tree to try to find out where this thing went. And they found tracks that looked like a huge bird of prey. And they said this thing was large, like seven, eight feet tall, large. Yeah. So, just, I mean, that's standard operating procedure. If you're out there and the dogs are going nuts <laughs> and you're in the dark and you see a large uh, object with yellow eyes, standard operating procedure for, for people in the, in the country is shoot it. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, that's, at, at that point, with everything else that's going on, I could absolutely see how that, and that's weird that they found tracks and it was a huge, what they consider bird of prey. Okay. Yes, uh, it, it, they, they had this huge talon impressions into the ground that looked like, you know, something like a, an eagle, a hawk, something like that, but very large, very large. Hmm. Um, in April of 1997, uh, this was the, uh, the event with the bulls. So uh, Terry had his bulls out there, and they were in the corral. Yeah. Um, he, he came back from somewhere and noticed that they were all missing. And, you know, these are expensive bulls, so he's freaking out. Yeah. Uh, you know, where, 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 are, where do these bulls go? Well, in the corral is a trailer, a very small trailer. Probably for just at, shipping one or two if you have to take yeah, it someplace. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and so he gets curious, and he kind of climbs up on this trailer and looks down in it and realizes that all of the bulls are neatly packed like sardines in this trailer, and they were in some kind of trance. They were just kind of almost like asleep. And so after having found them, you know, he yelled at his wife and, you know, to let her know. And they broke from this trance and started panicking and almost destroyed this trailer trying to get out. Yeah. And so the NIDS team kind of did a little research into that and discovered that the, the corral's structure, which it's, it's a metal corral, right, mm-hmm. had been highly magnetized, which yeah. is very odd. Yeah, that's, that's extremely odd. Okay. Um, so that was some of the things that happened. Uh, George Knapp had talked about um, just some of the weird stuff. They they had gone out there with night vision and and went on to the Mesa, and they had seen the same portal that uh, that Terry Sherman had seen the the orange glow with the the whatever. Right. Except the, mm-hmm. yeah, except that through the night vision, they were able to see something come out of that portal some kind of creature came out of that portal onto the ranch and then the portal disappears and then this creature just kind of goes off into the night and they couldn't track it any further um that was one of the strange things that happened um yeah that's and 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 look in regards to portals um and we'll, i'll cover this real quick before we have to cut to a commercial break there but in regards to portals i believe um what what we know now of things like uh quantum entanglement um and things like that 
I believe 100% in portals. I believe that if, if we did have any type of um, alien life form that was here uh, long, you know, millions of years ago, per se, that they would have known of things that we know now of quantum entanglement where two particles can be in two different locations and, and transfer data between them, um, that they would have technology. That's how they would travel. They would travel through what I believe to be portals rather than trying to bend space-time. Right? If you were here once before you'd be able to set up some type of quantum you know, entanglement and be able to transfer either data, information, or even bigger objects through that portal. Um, and then you would hide that portal someplace, and that's why I, I believe a lot of times portals are hidden deep within, you know, forests and stuff like that because they don't want you to find it, right? They want to put it someplace, and it's in the Amazon, someplace that's not going to be industrialized, and you're going to knock it down to build a skyscraper. Um, right, and, You know, right. so <laughs> I do believe in that because that is technology technically that we might not be that far off in creating ourselves because of the technology and 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 the uh, that we have now in regards to uh, entanglement of particles and Einstein uh, spooky um, action at a distance type stuff. Do you I, you, do you agree with that? I think. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I um I have a different um, understanding with regards to like quantum theory and all of this i mm -hmm. i i, I kind of cling to a different um let's say a different scientific i i i had read a lot of nikola tesla and uh charles proteus steinmetz and some of the stuff they were talking about and i kind of adhere more to what they they believed in about this stuff as um i when, when we talk about this yeah. kind of stuff, you know, people we'll talk about, mul <laughs> mul yeah, it, it's almost needs its own show for that. But, but essentially the, uh, the, the ether theory, um, ether physics that they were into, um, is a lot different from quantum mechanics because when, when relativity came along and then quantum, um, they're, they are, um, they're atomists, materialists. Um, right. if, if they can't count it, it doesn't exist. Um, gotcha. You know, they state this many, many times. That's why they won't go into ghosts, spooky action at a distance or any kind of the stuff that we're talking about with Skinwalker Ranch because they can't count. They can't quantify it. That's where quantum comes from. Right. Where, you know, Nikola Tesla and some of these early electrical engineers understood that not everything was quantifiable, mm -hmm. but you could qualify it. And that's where the, the ether theory comes in. And that's where I think these wormholes come from, because they believe that there were only two dimensions. This one and the other one, which is actually counterspatial or counterdimensional. In other words, it has no dimension, but it was uh, this other dimension, we'll say, yeah. um, is pure potential. And I believe this pure potential is what they use to travel through. So to get from one space to the other, they would travel through this counterspatial dimension to get to wherever else they wanted to go. So they're not coming from another dimension. They're coming from another space using this dimension that's that's what i believe yeah and that's a, that's a whole this is something too we'll talk about in another show but and the reason i wanted to bring that up now is it kind of backs a little bit of stuff that you've just heard about what he what, what the professor talked about in regards to uh you know sounds of electricity and and magnetism and things that are happening in in regards to how these things might be traveling and stuff like that but you're going to have to stay tuned for part two because we're, we're not even close to done here. Um, and we have so much more we want to talk about. But like I said, stay tuned for part two. Um, you're listening to us on Subspace Odyssey Radio, and we'll be right back. Stay here. When I was young, my daddy said, gotta keep one eye open in your bed. Because there's a time coming when the devil going to come for you. Sage from Sage Outcast, and I've been in the logistics and trucking fields for over 20 years. And for 12 of those 20 years, I've been dealing with the same factoring company. It's a great factoring company, and they've given me the opportunity to give you guys a fantastic factoring deal. It's with a factoring company that is both established with a bank and traded on the stock market, so you don't have to worry about them going under. Also, it's a factoring company that will give you a fantastic rate on your carrier and brokerage. So when it's time to grow your company to that next level, don't go with a factoring company that won't give you an opportunity to bring your brokerage on also. Go ahead and shoot me an email with your contact information, and I'll go ahead and reach out and hook you up with one of the best factoring companies out there. All right, we are back here uh, at Sage Outcast, and we're listening to us on Subspace Odyssey Radio. I'm Sage. I'm with my host, the professor. We are covering Skinwalker Ranch. 
Um, and we went through a whole, you know, uh, the beginning aspect to this. And, and Professor, where did we actually leave off at? So we left off with uh, some of the stories that came out of NIDS or the, the National Institute for Discovery Science and some of their research that was on the property. Mm -hmm. um, and NIDS kind of ended in, a, in around uh, 2004. So, and, and what's interesting, there, there seems to be a gap between 1997 and 2004 in their research. Um, and I, I found some things, um, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that, that are alleged that they discovered there. Um, but when we reach 2004, um, the end of NIDS, well, NIDS didn't end. They just changed their name. Mm. So we get into uh, what's called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And according, and now this, this comes from, you know, Wikipedia, yeah. but according to uh, Colm Kelleher and George Knapp, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program came out of another program called OSAP. And so OSAP is the Advanced Aerospace Weapon Systems Application Program. And I think that, that this is where it gets really confusing with the year, the dates, you know, who, who was involved, that sort of thing. So I'm going to do my best here to try to figure this out. Okay. Um, you know, according to Wikipedia, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program came about in 2007 and ended in 2012. But I believe it was the OSAP program that started in around maybe 2004, 2005. Um, and then kind of, it, it slowly morphed. You know, these things don't have like a dead, you know, the, the, at this date we stopped working and right. at this date we right. started doing this. Right. It's more of just kind of a constant, uh, gradual move into these different, different things. Mm -hmm. But apparently Robert Bigelow urged then Senator Harry Reid to begin a program in the defense intelligence agency. Yeah. And this program was budgeted $22 million over a five-year span. And according to uh, Colin Kelleher, it did not last five years. It got cut short uh, for whatever reason. Um, and, of course, Bigelow was awarded the contract through uh, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, or BASS. This is what the NIDS Institute, or the, the NIDS team, turned into. And so they went from being kind of a ragtag group of people who were funded by, you know, a billionaire to a really professional research team now funded by the government. Oh. Um, specifically through the Defense Intelligence Agency. Well, that changes things. Oh, yes, it does. Okay. They produced a 494-page report that detailed alleged worldwide UFO sightings over several decades. They built an entire database covering everything from Project Blue Book, Project Grudge, um, things that were happening in the military, military pilots that would uh, uh, come back and say, hey, I saw this. Um, this goes into like the, uh, the, the Tic Tac uh, UFO that was, that was seen. Yeah. All of that sort of thing fell under this, this, uh, this project. They also funded and published 38 studies of topics ranging from detection, high-resolution tracking of vehicles at hypersonic velocities, warp drive, dark energy, and the manipulation of extra dimensions. Mm, okay. Interesting. Um, interesting. The studies, con studies continued on the ranch for these UFOs, and this is when they discovered that there was a mysterious 1.6 gigahertz signal that was discovered with the phenomena. So when something would happen on the ranch, they discovered this signal was present. Really? 1.6? Um, okay. There were uh, alleged exotic materials recovered from the ranch. Um, there are pictures, I believe, that uh, uh, are on the show of these uh, rods that were found. I, I don't know if they're, I think they were dug up that were of exotic material that Robert Bigelow to this day still has. So somewhere, um, somewhere Robert Bigelow has a stash of everything that was collected on this ranch that we have not seen publicly. Mm. Um, now, whether or not he he has it or or somebody in the government has i don't know but somewhere there is a stash of all of the stuff that was discovered that has not been made public um wow. there were uh many excavations that took place 
Um, there was a possible expedition into a cave system on the property. Okay. Um, that is not definitive. That is a rumor. Um, and February 12th, 2012, the power was knocked out in nearby Fort Duchesne. Mm-hmm. And a strange eerie glow was seen in the sky above the town and a massive UFO was seen by multiple witnesses. So if you go back to February 12th, 2012, you might actually find some news articles regarding that. Yeah, I'll see what I can pull. Okay. Um, the program continued um, as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And this became funded by none other than none other than the Navy and the CIA. We talked about the Navy. Didn't we talk about the Navy in our last show? We did. Mm. We did. And of course, the and CIA, if, if they're involved in everything. like it, If they could oh yeah. be involved in a Boy Scout squad, they would. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, they want to be in, exactly. in everything. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So, and then according to uh, uh, Louis Elizondo, the successor of the program was the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Ta- Task Force, the UAPTF. The, these acronyms are just absolutely insane. Yeah, There's just so many different ones. And like I said, the years when all of this happened, when all of these merged, split, moved, it is is very fuzzy when you yeah. try to when you try to search into this stuff. And, and the best uh, information I could find was directly from Colm Kelleher and George Knapp when they talk about it because they were in it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, specifically Colm Kelleher, George Knapp. You know, he came in on certain things and was was notified about certain things and kind of helped them do some research. Um, so now we get into the Brandon Fugel era, which is the common era of the uh, the Skinwalker Ranch at this point. Um, so Brandon Fugel claims that he was an open skeptic. And, and if anybody doesn't know who, who Brandon Fugel is, he is essentially the Robert Bigelow of Utah. Okay, he's a real estate tycoon. Mm-hmm. Um, he owns uh, adamantium real estate. Mm-hmm. Um but he's also the same kind of kind of deal. They're they're kindred spirits, so to speak. They, uh, Brandon Fugel is is interested in paranormal, UFOs, all of that kind of thing. Um, and he was actually involved in 2000, 2010, He was involved in a frontier science endeavor dealing with gravitational physics. So in other words, a, a company had developed something and made some claims, and so uh, Fugel went in there with with a team. Um, whose senior advisors were actually senior advisors to the Bigelow Aerospace um, mm. venture. Okay. Along with his own people. And mm. uh, they ended up debunking whatever these claims were. So um, that that's Brandon Fugel, like I said, he, he's an open skeptic. So he's not, you know, he, he's not blindly following this stuff. He's trying to debunk it. Right. And, okay. and that was his point in buying Skinwalker Ranch. He wanted to debunk the phenomenon. Okay. So, uh, he, he met with Robert Bigelow, and they kind of talked about maybe a joint venture or a purchase. Um, so Fugel ended up purchasing the property in April of 2016 for a rumored $4.5 million. Wow. So we went from 200000 to $4.5 million. That's a heck of a return for Bigelow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's interesting. That's a big deal. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the... The original team, which is still sort of the same team that was there, we have Eric Bard, who's the principal investigator. We got uh, Thomas Winterton, who's the superintendent. We have uh, Brian Dragon Arnold, the head of security. And if anybody watches watches the show and has ever wondered why they call him Dragon, Please. here's the story behind that. Okay. Um, apparently, during the Bigelow era, they had their own security team that that covered the property, and there was one of uh, one of the security guys, big guy, very hostile, not a guy you want to mess with, and he ended up getting the nickname Dragon. And whenever they, uh, whenever they, um, whenever Fugel bought bought the property, they had kind of this exchange, like you, know, you ever seen the movies where they're standing on the bridge, and one side's on one one side, and the other side's on yeah. the other side, and they yeah. meet in the middle, and then they walk around, and then they walk their their own way. This actually happened on the property at the gate. And when this happened, that security guy kind of gave Brian uh, his dragon call sign. So that's mm. where he gets that from. That's not something that, you know, some nickname they gave him that, that actually came from somewhere. So okay. I, I thought that was interesting because I was like, why are they calling this guy dragon? <laughs> so, yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> and then we have uh, Caleb Bench. He's he's a security guy. Mm. Uh, Jim Sagala, who was a scientist. 
uh, Jim Morse, the ranch manager, Tom Lewis, and uh, Candace Linde, the uh, caretakers. Okay. And after the first season, if anybody took notice, uh, Jim Sagala was essentially replaced by Dr. Dra- Travis Taylor. Now, Travis Taylor came on to the first season, but it was kind of him and Sagala kind of trying to bounce ideas back and forth of what's going on. And it was clear that uh, Sagala had kind of a different a different viewpoint when it came to the property. Okay. He wasn't interested in the extra extraterrestrial aspect of it. He thought it was something else. Okay. But since uh History Channel came or well, History came in and started doing the show, which is owned by Disney. Yeah. Um and they're into the whole ancient alien thing, well that didn't quite work for the show, did it? No, I wouldn't. And there was some other, you know, uh, there was conflicts with with Dragon and Dr. Taylor in the first season because of this. And there was a lot of rumors about his departure from the show. Everything from, you know, he had had enough. It was scary. He didn't want to be there anymore to Mm -hmm. um, he had extremely different viewpoints that weren't, um, you know, along the lines of what where the show wanted to go. Okay. So I found that very interesting. Like I said, he he was not focused on the extraterrestrial aspect. And when they brought Dr. Taylor in, he was very interested in the extraterrestrial aspect. Um, you know, alien either way. But like I said, uh, and like I have said before, you know, you can be alien and not be extraterrestrial, correct? Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that's where that's that's where the show uh takes a different uh it takes a different stance during the second season when they get rid of uh, Sagala or whatever happened to him. Right. So let's talk about Dr. Travis Shane Taylor. All right. So he has a PhD uh, from the U- University of Alabama, Huntsville. He has written numerous technical papers, science fiction novels, and textbooks. Mm-hmm. Um, starting in around 1990, Taylor worked for various programs for the United, Sp- United States Department of Defense and NASA. Mm. He has researched several advanced propulsion concepts, um, human intelligence, image intelligence, and signals intelligence. Okay. He was briefly the informal chief scientist on the task force. Unidentified aerial phenomenal <clears throat> task force. You broke up there for a second. Okay. Oh, sorry. The, yes, the unidentified aerial phenomena task force. Uh, this is from season one to season four. That he was on this task force. And we had just talked about how this was funded by the, the Navy and the CIA. Right. So he was in it. He okay. was in it. Um, mm-hmm. And nobody on the show actually knew until the fourth season when he came out and told everybody. And I, I remember watching like first and second season. I'm like, this guy's hiding something. I know he is. <laughs> I know it. he's still hiding something right. as well, I believe. So let's talk about the discoveries that they have made on the show so far, because this is the first time cameras have been brought onto the property. And, this and is the first time. Hang on. Before that, hiding yeah. meaning that he might be under NDA. So oh, yeah. He just, oh, yeah. Absolutely. So because, it's not I mean, like he was. He was before. There's no reason yeah. to believe he's not now. Okay. So it might not be something that he just doesn't, you know, he can't tell. Right. So it's not just. Him not yeah, wanting I, I'm to not, yeah, yeah. To be clear, I'm not attacking his character. I think he's, he, he's he's a good person. It's just that you know, th- there's there's some stuff going on in the background that we are not aware of. Correct. And there's there's plenty of yep. stuff. Believe me. Um, so the discovery so far on the show, because like I said, this is the first time cameras have been brought onto the property. This is the first time things have been made public. So they're kind of reinventing the wheel as far as rediscovering some of the things that the NIDS team discovered. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're doing a lot of research into what, uh, w- with what they can of what the NIDS team did, did back then. Um, and so, so far what we have are uh, digging operations appear to trigger events for whatever reason. The strange signals spanning the entire spectrum seem to show up when these uh, these events occur. <clears throat> uh, uh, I had said before about the 1.6 gigahertz frequency that seems to spike up during these events. This yeah. is no different. They, they discovered this as well. Um, there are physiological episodes that happen to certain people on the ranch when these events occur. And it seems to be uh, certain people, uh, Thomas Winterton seems to be the most, um, I guess, sensitive towards this because he had an episode before the show got started. Um, And I believe that was one of the reasons Jim Segala was brought on board to kind of try to investigate what happened to him. Because what happened was 
um, he started getting really bad headaches. And uh, when he went to the hospital, the back of his skull, the skin started separating from the skull. Um, and, you know, he had a neurological episode. He was in the hospital for a little while. Um, he finally got over it. He got better, came back to the ranch. And ever since then, you know, he'll get headaches and, and feel really weird and have to leave the ranch. So he's kind of targeted a lot during the show. Okay. Um, episodes with uh, Travis Taylor have also happened. Um, he's been hit by, uh, uh, I, I believe it was like beta and gamma radiation coming from Homestead 2. Uh, when they were playing around with it, there's a well over there and they were kind of playing around, looking in it, seeing what was, you know, what was in it and all yeah. that stuff. And it, it hit him. Um, but a Faraday cage seems to dull the physiological effects. And they use a silo um, that's that's next to Homestead 1. You know, if they start feeling weird or whatever, they jump in the silo, shut the door, and all of a sudden it goes away. Um, okay. So clearly some kind of radio frequency interference of some kind that's causing these effects to occur. Um, they discovered that uh, they can trigger UFOs with uh, using rockets to trigger these UFOs to appear, which is, which is kind of odd. I, I don't understand how, you know, why that would be. It's, it's just kind of a strange thing, but they discovered that and, and it's almost become a meme now. Like, okay, what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to launch rockets. That's what we're going to do. So like every time they do an experiment, there are rockets that are going up. Okay. Um, now, Dr. Taylor has hypothesized that the entire Uintah Basin is essentially shaped like a massive dish and could theoretically be used to send or receive signals from space, hmm. which is interesting. Like, yeah. if you look at the entire base, I mean, it's huge. It's, it's massive. And where, where Skinwalker Ranch sits, it's, it's almost at the center of that basin. So it would be, you know, essentially the L and B of that antenna, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Um, UFOs seem to have something to do with the cows dying. They're, they're for whatever reason, and, and it's, you know, this has always been a thing with UFOs and, and cattle mutilation, that sort of thing. Um, they have, uh, they actually have on camera a cow uh, kind of by itself, and it ends up dying. And they found out in the same frames that they were looking at this cow up in the sky, there was an object. Mm. Um, a very fast moving object. I think it was only in like a few frames and it was gone. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that the cows that have died to these UFOs have a strange electronic signature that's left on the body that impedes predation. So normally when something dies, cow, whatever, mm -hmm. the predators will move in and, and pick it clean and, right. and that's it. They sniff it. Well, these don't, yeah. yeah, these don't do that. These don't do that at all. And the only thing, and this is interesting, um, they actually had somebody come onto the property and claim that if a cow gets struck by lightning, this also occurs. Mm, okay. So we have another kind of electrical phenomena associated with that. So that I found that interesting. Yeah. Um, petroglyphs have been discovered on the property, which I found interesting. It kind of goes more towards the history of the property. Um, Homestead 2 seems to exhibit strange phenomena from sporadic gamma and radiation to uh, drastic temperature changes. Um, I think the NIDS team had talked about uh, one of the stories where uh, they were out there with um, one of the uh, – somebody from the Pentagon came out to visit, and they were walking out down the road one night, and they reached this spot where they could literally stick their hand out and feel a wall of cold. And we're, we're not talking a few degrees here. We're talking like 10, 20 degree difference. Hmm. Um, and this was also witnessed by the, uh, the current team that's there. They had brought a rabbi onto the property and he sat in front of Homestead too and did uh, a chant that he claimed would, would uh, uh, kind of um, a, a portal chant of some kind that would make this thing occur. And when he did this, you know, they had uh, uh, infrared cameras on Homestead too. And it was, they could see it clearly that all of a sudden this cold spot started emanating from the building and moved its way out and got bigger. And they walked down there and they were like, wow, this is a big, big temperature differential, uh, which I find absolutely astounding. Yeah. I mean, wasn't there also, correct me if I'm wrong, like tunnel networks underground with water would disappear or something? Wasn't there? Oh yeah, yeah that that happened as well. Whoa, yeah, we'll get to that. That's that's okay. part of my research into the property um, as well. 
because uh, yeah, there, there does seem to be some kind of tunnel network or something going on underground because they had poured I forget how many gallons of water and they they put this uh, dye in the water to try to see if they could find out where it was going if it came out somewhere else on the property or or whatnot. And, nothing, and yeah. uh, nothing. They they couldn't find anything. And then they end up going on the mesa where they think there was a cave system there. And they they go drop in, uh, in these smoke bombs. And they started getting sucked in. And the smoke never came back out. Yeah. And so they're like, something's going on in here. Right. Um, okay. Somebody has made the claim that uh, in that area where they found the cave, that uh, the way the rocks are, are situated, the boulders uh, going up that hill... That it almost looks like somebody did some blasting to cover a hole, and mm. uh, in in my research, you know, if you, you can get on Google Earth and look at this yourself, um, you know, Google Earth has the kind of the time machine where you can go back and look at different satellite images, and going all the way back to the Bigelow era, um, that pile of rocks was there. So if there was any blasting or anything that took place, it took place long before even the Shermans got there. Yeah. Um, so that it's kind of hard to tell what what I I do believe there is a cave system back there. Um, I believe there it may be um, you know man made as far as like because there's a a mine close by. Mm -hmm. So obviously may, maybe there were some mining operations going on. But along with that, I think there's some other tunnel systems that may be older. Okay. Um, and and these things have been discovered using various ground pen penetrating radar around the ranch and on the mesa. They they've brought in all kinds of ground penetrating radar and found all kinds of weird stuff um, under there. And and uh, there, there's there's an object that's on the mesa that's about a hundred feet tall that's in there, um, which I, I thought was interesting. And then they they uh, brought in a directional boring machine to try to to try to reach that area to see if they can hit it. And they kept hitting an object that uh, the the operator claimed he he thought it was it was kind of bowl shaped or something that he was hitting, and the material that came out of that they had analyzed by the University of Utah, and oh. they claimed that it was exotic man made materials the the exact same materials that you would find on the tiles for the space shuttle the reentry tiles. Oh, okay, like the the heat. Uh, yes, uh, yes. What it's called? I can't. I know what you're talking about, though. Okay. Um, another interesting thing about the ranch is that certain places around the ranch seem to absorb lidar data. And what is lidar data? Now, lidar data. This is, uh, from what I understand, I believe um, it sends out an infrared signal. I'm not entirely sure how lidar works, um, but essentially, it sends out a a a signal. That bounces. It's a lot like radar, okay. But instead of, of using radio, it's using light, lasers, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and I think it's an infrared laser that it uses, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure somebody in the comments will correct me on that. Yes, please. Do. Um, right. But uh, at Homestead Two, they did a a lidar scan and discovered that inside the building, one of the buildings at Homestead Two, nothing came back. Like it was just an empty black hole inside that building. And one of the recent episodes of the show, they used LIDAR data from a drone as they were conducting some of their, their, their research um, and some of the things they were doing. And when they went back and looked at it, there was this massive black hole right on what, what they call the triangle, which is kind of in the center of the ranch. Mm -hmm. And you can see this, this data. It's in the show. You can see it. There's a black hole and a ring that spans out almost as if the laser data was bouncing off of something and getting redirected in a ring around this black hole. So very interesting. And this is exactly the same spot where they have found a very high energy something, so, some kind of high energy uh, zone that's about a mile above this triangle area. And there's another intense uh, form of energy that sits about 30 feet above the ground at the triangle area. And this, and like I said, this is the same place where this lidar data just disappears. Yeah. So very interesting. Very interesting. They've had, uh, they've launched rockets up, and it would hit this thirty foot mark, and the rocket would just explode or veer off or do something strange. Mm -hmm. So something was going on with that. Um, I believe they had, they did, they got up in a helicopter and, and dropped balls down. They did all kinds of stuff. And they discovered that whatever this was, um, they had actually brought a, a bunch of. Um, astronomers out 
um, to essentially aim their telescopes through this energy to look at the stars on the other side to see if there was any variance or any weird, th- you know, what the, the, what kind of distortion are we looking at is what they were trying to figure out. Yeah. And what was interesting is, is that as these astronomers were pointing, they, they would, you know, they, they would calibrate their equipment using different stars and they, they would calibrate and then they would aim it at this area and they would try to pick a star that was back there. They said that in the database of the telescope that they were using, the stars in that zone were being deleted from the system in real time as they were working. You gotta be kidding me. No. How's that possible? Exactly. That is one of the the strange things Ooh. that happens on the property. So, I mean, clearly very intelligent. I mean, if the CIA had something like this, you know, you would point your finger at them and say, they did it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because, like, obviously somebody's somebody's pulling something. So, it, yeah. very, very strange, very odd. Not something that we have any known capability of being able to do. Wow. Um, so there was there was one episode where they they brought in a well drilling rig. I believe this was near the triangle. I'm not sure if it was on it. Um, well, no, it may have been on the triangle. And when the well drilling rig got to a certain depth, they noticed that the drilling rig itself became highly magnetized. So they would pull out compasses and they would all point towards this drilling rig mm-hmm. as it was drilling. So I found that interesting because that kind of harkens back to the many different things on the ranch that become magnetized for no reason. Yeah. Um, there's this thing. This is this is one of the more interesting aspects is is what's called the hitchhiker effect. Okay. And um, I had listened to an interview with Colin Kelleher and George Knapp, and they they talk about this as being one of the most significant effects on the ranch. And what this is is somebody will come onto the ranch, have an experience, and when they go home, this experience seems to come back with them. So they'll go home, think everything's okay, and then all of a sudden they start seeing orbs in their backyard. Or they'll start seeing weird creatures in their woods. Or they'll start seeing UFOs. Or they'll start having poltergeist activity happen in their house. And what's interesting is, what will happen is all of a sudden their neighbors will start having things happen in their house. And then maybe they'll have some friends that come over or whatever, and their friends will go home, and then something will happen at their house. And they have hearkened, or they've, they've claimed that it's Almost like, uh, you know, it's almost like a, a, a virus. It's almost like, uh, you know, they catch something, bring it home, and then it spreads. It starts spreading. Now, they say uh, it, it doesn't go, you know, it, it doesn't spread like wildfire. It eventually stops, slows down, and there's, you know, it, it eventually dissipates and goes away. Um, but they were talking about many, many people who have come onto the ranch have had this happen to them, including Dr. Taylor. I think there was an interview with him where um, he started having weird stuff happen at his home in Alabama after having visited. The- so I found that very interesting. So basically, the like they say that, you know, paranormal or spirits can attach themselves uh, to a person and they can go home with that person. We're, we're talking the same possibility here. Yes, yes, yes. The exact same effect. Um, and it's just weird. The, 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 the way it spreads is, is very odd. But uh, some people have actually had medical episodes um, that last years. Um, there was a story that uh, uh, Kelleher and Knapp had told about uh, one of the uh, people on the science advisory board that had visited the ranch. And then they were you know driving home or something happened and an orb mm-hmm. entered into the vehicle and went through his body. Through his body, and he ended up having radiation burns from some kind of they 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 said it was it appeared to be a non ionizing radiation because even though they they ended up getting something that kind of looked like cancer, it didn't metastasize and and it 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 took them like two years to get over it completely. But you know they started losing their hair, um, sunburns, um, you know all, the whole nine yards, and uh, yeah, it's just very interesting the hitchhiker effect. Hmm. That's interesting. And okay. so, yeah, I went over the uh, I went over the um, 
the the energy field above the ranch. Um, a lot of the GPS data that they try to capture when on the ranch likes to go underground for some reason. In fact, one of the airplanes I think that they flew over um, in doing kind of a GPS survey, they discovered that the the GPS hit came or ended up 62 miles below the ground. And when uh, Dr. Taylor heard this, he sat back in his chair and he was like, you got to be kidding me. It's like 62 miles. He was like, yeah. He was like, you know, that's the Carmen line. That's, that's the line that we consider to be the transition into space is 62 miles above, above the, uh, the surface. Okay. And so then he makes he, he kind of makes a, a quick statement. If you don't catch it, you, you would have missed it. But he says, well, what happens when you go 62 miles down? And I was like, hmm, now you're on to something, Dr. Travis Taylor. Um, I, I found that very interesting. So 62 miles up is a transition into space. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. A- approximately. Where, and then it just so happens that this thing goes 62 miles down. Yes, the GPS data from this airplane and came it it ended up sixty two miles below the surface. Weird. Okay. Very weird. And this is this has happened many times where they'll they'll come over and and the GPS data just goes underground for some strange reason. Um, so and like I said before, there there appears to be an underground cave system in the area. I believe it spans the ranch, if not further. Um, mm-hmm. The, but, and there uh, was mining that took place both on in these areas, which would say, which would dictate that there's some type of cave system down there if they were mining. Correct? Yes, yes. The team is actually off camera has gone to several different mines in the area that are off the property um, and have kind of gone into these. There's actually video on YouTube of them doing this. Um, you can look it up, and uh, they kind of go in as far as they go, and and kind of the, you know they're trying to figure out if there's a connection, um, like a connecting tunnel system or something like that is what they're looking for. And, and of course, they're doing this because it's easier than blasting out the side of the mesa and going. You know, they're trying to find another <laughs> yeah. way, a cheaper way, a less intrusive way to get in these tunnels. So I, that's that's kind of what they're I doing. I believe Carl Crusher is on the property next door to the Skywalker Ranch right now. And they have tracks that that they're looking for an entrance to the mine. I believe, correct? Yeah, there's a there's a couple of people that are there. There's actually a guy. I forget his name. I need to find out if he has a YouTube channel because somebody interviewed him. There's a guy that bought the property to the south of Skinwalker Ranch, and he has set up kind of his own research station there. And uh, he does the same thing. He he goes around the area. He he you know interviews people, tries to find these cave systems, and 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 kind of witnesses what happens on the ranch um, as it happens. So I, I found that interesting. So a lot of interest, a lot of interest, definitely. Yeah. That's de- yeah. Um, one of the interesting things that has happened recently on the show is that uh, they they flew a drone over the property, and I, and I forget what technology they used. Um, but they discovered some kind of tracks under the ground um, near one of the watchtowers. And these were uh, uh, lateral tracks that went along. There was like two or three of them kind of parallel. And then one that was kind of curved that went into it. It, it was an odd shape, mm-hmm. but but looked kind of man-made. Yeah. So what they did was they got an excavator out there and they kind of went along to try to find out what was under there. And... Uh, they found some strange material laid out in these fields that was underground. And they were trying to figure out what in the world this was all about. Cause there was a clear layer of this stuff that was going across the property. And, you know, they started doing stuff. Or they started talking stuff about, uh, you know, it, it almost looks like the, the property has, it's has is made up like a circuit board. And this is kind of one of the circuits or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. just something they were throwing out there. Um, but that was really odd. And uh, like I said before, when they drilled into the Mesa, they had revealed um, that there was some manufactured material in there. So a lot of interesting and weird things that the show has has pulled up, as well as some of the things that happened during the NIDS uh, uh, research era. Mm-hmm. So now we get into my personal research Uh-oh. into the ranch. Okay. Um, 
and this is kind of something that they just they they don't talk about on the show for whatever reason. Um, one of the interesting things about the ranch is that it's located 604 miles from the Canadian border and 615 miles from the Mexican border. Hmm. So it is literally in the middle of the United States out there. In fact, it's, that's only like five miles off, I believe. Right. And depending on where you put the pin, it could be even closer, basically. And what's interesting is that, you know, the Canadian border and the Mexican border, that's, that's just an arbitrary line that we kind of made up as a border. It's not like some natural, you know, something that would, you know, why yeah. is it sitting there? Is that just a coincidence? If yeah. it is, that's a heck of a coincidence, right? Right. It's right. very strange. Um, another thing they don't talk about is that the ranch is located approximately one mile above sea level. And the energy that they found above the ranch is also one mile above ground level, which is interesting to me. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another interesting thing, and I, I know I sent you a lot of pictures, and one of them is of the hundreds of fracking operations that are occurring around the ranch uh, to the south um, and to the west. And I mean thousands like yeah you know, I, I know we we've had discussions about you know liquid natural gas in the united states getting into that and all these fracking operations mm -hmm. there are thousands of them surrounding this ranch in fact one of them is only 1500 feet from the southernmost portion of the ranch um so hmm. i kind of wonder you know I, I had talked about some of these other other topics that we have discussed and how like oil companies electric companies and all of this stuff what do they know what have these fracking operations run into? You got to think if digging is something that causes this phenomenon to show up, a fracking operation is is prime suspect. Yeah, to have some strange things happen to them, right? Right, and and fracking is basically based on hey, we're going to take it, when you go to drill for oil and stuff like that. They've learned that fracking you can pump salt water down and push up some of this oil to it makes life easier when it comes to finding oil, right? That's the gist of it. There's some other technical stuff, but that's kind of the gist of it. So you're digging down, you're drilling down, and when you're going to use a rig, a rig might, you know, you're drilling a hole in a rig, you're setting up there. If you find something, great. If you don't, you're ordering another permit and moving 10 feet, and you're trying it again some other place. So you're constantly digging, you know, different holes in different spots along a line that, yes, if you're digging... Oil rigs and fracking uh, rigs dig fairly consistently all the time on specific paths. Yeah, that would set it off. I mean, because it's not like you're digging a hole and then you're driving 50 miles someplace else. You're moving right, right. A, f a couple yeah, feet. And, and if right. you look at, at the satellite data, like it's, it's, it's mind-blowing how many of these operations are surrounding this ranch. You zoom out and there's just dot, 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 dot everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I have to wonder, you know, some of the seismic activity that has occurred on the ranch, you know, how much does that have to do with it? That mm -hmm. would be an interesting uh, thing to look into. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's another thing that uh, a few people have pointed out. Uh, I think George Knapp's pointed out. Um, some other people have about Bottle Hollow Reservoir, which is located just north of the ranch. That has a very colorful history. Um, there's a lot of UFO activity surrounding that. There's some kind of snake serpent monster that's, that's, uh, that, uh, the native Americans have said lives there and, and grabs people. A lot of people have died there. Um, the reason it got its name is because I think there was a, a brothel or something that was there, um, long time ago and they would throw all their bottles in this, this hollow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, eventually we came along and filled it up with water and turned it into a reservoir. Okay. Um, so that that is very interesting because a lot of these weird incidents seem to um, seem to like to be close to water. Yeah. Um, so water has some kind of has something to do with it, and that's probably the largest body of water near the ranch. There, there's actually another small um, pond that's actually on the way into the ranch, uh, but Bottle Hollow Reservoir is a very large body of water um, compared to that. Hmm. Hmm. So, when they discovered the 100-plus-foot-tall object in the Mesa, mm -hmm. and I, I was looking at the GPR data trying to you – know, I'm not a GPR data expert, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to, to figure out what this is I'm looking at in the data. 
it sounded and and looked to me almost like we have some kind of monolith in the mesa okay and what it reminded me of was a story i heard from mr mythos channel and this comes from the inner earth conspiracy theories number four so if you want to go watch that you can Mm -hmm. it was there was this this uh, object which was given the name moon shaft and it was a large mysterious structure discovered in a slovakian cave in the northern mountainous region by a resistance soldier in 1944 um antonin harrock was his name he was a rebel fighter and he was hiding out in a cave um, with another guy who was injured and they were trying to survive and it was it was winter time so that's why they were in the cave um out of curiosity he ventures further into the cave for 90 minutes without much resistance so he, he got a pretty good ways into this yeah, cave wandered around there he eventually reaches a small uh, a, a small vent and crawls into it. And when he crawled inside, he sees this large black silo framed in white in this cave. It was glass smooth, man-made looking structure, which reached into the rocks on all sides um, and had a dia- it was It was cylindrically curved, but he, was, he could only see one side of it. And it looked as if it had a diameter of about 82 feet. Hmm. Where the structure and the rocks met, there were large stalagmites and stalactites that formed the glittering white frames. Whatever it was had been a very long time. Very long time. Okay. The wall uh, was uniformly blue-blackish, and its materials combined the properties of steel, flint, and rubber. Um, he had a he had a pick with him, and uh, it made absolutely no marks and bounced off of it uh, whenever he would hit it. Okay. Um, it was a tower-sized artifact in the middle of an obscure mountain in a region where no legend knew about it. In other words, after he got out of this, he kind of asked around to see, hey, you guys know about this? And nobody knew about it. Mm-hmm. Um, the only blemish was a vertical crack that was about nine inches in width at the bottom and tapered up to the ceiling. And somehow he was able to squeeze himself into this, this crack. He, he heard water at the bottom of the chamber, and it was, it was completely dark. He couldn't see anything. Um, he got in there. It was large on the inside, eventually. But just a very strange Hang on. story eventually, about a mono. You broke up a second. Eventually, he what? Uh, eventually, he squeezed his way out. He, he, okay. he, he was terrified because it was, it was dark. It was tight spaces, so he eventually squeezed his way out. Um, and this, from what I understand, they kept this a secret for a really, really long time. And a lot of people in Slovakia who know of this story have tried to go out and try to find this cave and try to find this thing. Um, and it's rumored that uh, somebody from the government had come along and blasted this cave shut mm-hmm. for whatever reason. That's the rumor. Don't know if yeah. that's true or not, but that's what I've heard. Um, but a strange, I mean, this is, this is a strange monolith found in a cave inside a mountain. Um, and it sounds a lot like what they found on Skinwalker Ranch. And you got to wonder what this thing is, what it was for, what its purpose was, who built it, how did yeah. they build it, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I found that very interesting. Yeah, that is um, awesome. And then, like I've said before, um, there are other places like Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch is not the only one. It's just the only one that has been made famous and kept a secret and then made public and, and people want it. People want to do research on it. Um, but there are other places like Mount, Wil- Mount Wilson Ranch, that's in Nevada. We've got uh, Mount Shasta in California, mm-hmm. the Archuleta Mesa, New Mexico, the Montana Vortex, which is actually near Glacier National Park. And I wished when I went up there, I had known about that because I would have <laughs> gone there and visited it. Because apparently the Montana Vortex was bought by some, uh, some astrophysicists oh, to really? study it. And they kind of opened it up as, as kind of a, an amusement park of sorts where people can come in and look at it. I mean, the trees bend around in weird, in weird spiral ways. Uh, you know, the, there's weird thing that weird optical illusions where you can stand next to a person who's taller than you and you appear taller than them. That'd be great. All kinds of weird stuff. I'm, All kinds of weird. I, stuff. I'm only five, eight. So that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, there's green mountain trail in Alabama, uh, the Boone vortex in North Carolina, the, uh, Lockagee rock vortex in Kentucky, um, the Oregon vortex in Oregon, and uh, you know, and this isn't 
you know, this isn't just something that happens in the United States. This is all over the world. There are places. And in listening to uh, Colm Kelleher talk about, um, and Colm Kelleher, he's, he's an uh, Irish uh, PhD mm-hmm. uh, or Irish born PhD who was on uh, uh, Bigelow's team and uh, on subsequent teams. And he, he was kind of the, the ringleader for, for a good long time. He talks about uh, some of the studies they did when, whenever they were being funded by the DIA of how they got a hold of some Russian material, or not material, but Russian uh, uh, books and, and research that came from the Soviet era. Right. And they brought in a Russian translator to translate it and, and, and uh, provide that to them. And they found out that, you know, not only in the United States, but the Russians, once again, just like the Bigfoot episode we talked about, the Russians took this a lot more seriously than we did. Yeah. You know, we we have this weird stigma here where this is laughed at and, and scoffed at. And over there, they took it very seriously and had been studying this stuff for 70 plus years. Hmm. Um, so and, and so they have their own skinwalker ranches over there in Russia, too. And they have a lot more landmass. So they probably have a lot more skinwalker yeah. ranches yeah, exactly. out there and a lot of weird stuff that they have studied. But when it comes to paranormal stuff, the Soviets really took this stuff a lot more seriously when, than we did and did a lot more serious research into it. And it almost seems like we were kind of playing catch up to a certain degree. Now, that's not to include maybe some private endeavors or maybe something that the Navy was into right. or the CIA for that matter or the Air Force. Um, but publicly, we're behind, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so at this point, it's kind of speculation time okay. as to what's going on here. What, what is happening here? And um, I have made the suggestion and the claim that uh, with with my theory on the underground civilization that that Skinwalker Ranch is kind of a node, uh, a nodal point, say uh, a a point at which they exit. Because um, when we were talking when we're talking portals, mm-hmm. um, I believe that they use this technology to get from underground to the surface because. Over thousands of years, we have a lot of geological stuff that happens um, that, that, yeah. can, that can break off cave systems and, and cause you not to be able to get to the surface easily. So a technology like portal technology would make it super simple. You don't have mm-hmm. to dig out anything. You can just go from here to there. Right. Um, and I believe Skinwalker Ranch is one of these points um, where this happens because everything that I've heard uh, you know, from everybody who's been onto the ranch, everything happens to the west of – Homestead One, which is the triangle, um, mm-hmm. which is the the uh, vortex that we see in the lidar data, which is the the energy, um, the energy that we see sitting above the ranch. It's all it's all connected, and it all seems to be uh, some kind of maybe permanent portal that exists there, and maybe there is some machinery, some some kind of uh, infrastructure that keeps it open. And that may have something to do with the monolith in the mesa. That may have something to do with the the thing they keep hitting when they try to bore into the mountain. Yeah, that may have something to do with it. It may be something directly under the the triangle. We don't know. Um, but until they get, until they start, <laughs> literally, until they start blasting the side of that mesa open, we may never know. Um, because right. that's what it's going to take to get back there and get into these tunnel systems and determine what's under here. What what, what do we have? Um, so, like I said, my, my theory is that this is an underground civilization. What we're seeing is them coming into uh, – coming onto the surface from below. Uh, some of the strange <clears throat> animals and, and things that we see um, could be something that they are creating, something that they have. They could be pets. They could be – uh, perhaps wild animals underground. Who knows? It could, and it, um, it, 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 it might even just be the defense mechanism that one at one time protect protected this underground civilization, right? Yeah, if they had, yeah, if they it, had tech, yeah. future technology, they were like, look, this is where we're going to be, and maybe say, you know, down the, down the road, we're like, hey, obviously, you know, we need some type of protection, some type of defense mechanism, and all this is is the minute that this stuff starts to get hit, you know, feeling this, this type of threatening. This is just technology defense mechanism that is kicking on and saying, hey, uh, yes, I, I, danger, completely, danger. <laughs> I, I completely agree uh, with the way the orbs react with. The, and, and, you know, they're, they're so small. They're not manned, of course. Correct. That's what I'm saying. Um, 
And then you have the the signals intelligence, the signals that cause physiological distress. Right. Um, you know, all of this does sound like a defense mechanism. Yeah, and 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 so if it's something's down there, and and whatever's down there is obviously, you know, one doesn't want to be found, or two, if if they were aging per se, and they were obviously not, but they did have future technology, you're you're going to want a better defense mechanism down to to be able to protect you and your aging years to make sure, let's say, um, for this technology type stuff too, to protect the technology that you don't want us to find. Um, or protect them that were down there at one time that, like I said, right now it's just activating be- to protect itself as a base, as an underground base, if that makes sense. Right, right. You know, so it, that's a good possibility, too. And and just like you said, it, it everything seems to sound like something that would be, you know, a, a, defense, a defense mechanism. So that could absolutely, you know... It, it, Look, it's it's what I would have designed if I was a futurist, and you know, from the future, basically, would be this type of things. To look, I don't want to have to hurt you, but I'm going to have to scare the hell out of you. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have, to, you know what I mean? Um, until you get to the point that you end up in my home, then you know, then it, who knows what happens if we get down there? Right, right, and I and I feel like the the Skinwalker legend is you know perhaps something that happened, but I feel like it's kind of the smokescreen. Um, that's, that's, uh, the, the legend told to kind of, uh, I, I guess, get your mind off of the technological aspect that we're talking about here. Um, because if, if let's say the civilization had been around that long, which I believe it has, mm-hmm. um, that would have been a very convenient way to scare people off. You know, the, the, you got a house out in the middle of the woods or something, you want to scare people off, or you make up some kind of story like a witch lives there or, you know, whatever, and nobody's going to come up there cause they're scared. Um, you know, the same thing goes with Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah, and that's a good point. And and it could have even been looked. It wasn't the fact that it was a witch, but it was somebody that was able to determine how this de- defense mechanism would kick off, and they used that to their advantage. At one point, uh, civilizations used eclipses to say, "Look, I can control this, and and you know they're going to block out the sun, and the, dra- the this dragon's going to eat the sun, but I'll defend you, and the sun will come back." Right? And it's just that the other people didn't know of the time of a lunar and solar eclipse right so oh yeah yeah. it it could this person so that person might be considered a witch because they could predict a solar eclipse when technically it was math you know what i'm saying and and or or it was told to them or it was told to them maybe they were in contact you know who who knows absolutely so i i do believe that it's a possibility that it I, i something's there Something's weird there. Is it, you know, and I do believe it's a possibility with everything that's happened that. And, you know, one thing now that I'm thinking about it with with regards to this portal technology, I would like to know, and I have not heard anybody say it yet, but I would like to know if the same sound um, associated with some of these 411 missing disappearances of oh. the, the, the kind of metal clanging sound or, yeah. or car door slam car door sound. Yeah. have been heard on the ranch or around the ranch. I would be very interested to know um, if that's the case because, you know, we hear a lot about that. I do, um, yeah, that's know, a good point. We've talked about that on past show is the car door sound, metal car door sound. And, I, and I've heard other people mention that. Well, that's a good point, too. Well, I'll tell you what. I want to. I want to thank you so much for doing this. I know you held back so much more, <laughs> um, and just to try to get this in in there in our time frame for our show. But um, this has been a great show. You did a great job. Is there anything you want to kind of finish off with? I would just say, like I said, we couldn't include everything for time constraints, but definitely, you know, read uh, read Hunt for the Skinwalker. Um, the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Uh, watch the show. Uh, there's plenty of information out there that everything that I have done has been open source um, investigation. So you can do this on your own. And I would suggest you do so. So you can hear some of these crazier stories that we couldn't get to. Yeah. Yeah. Get yourself a shovel because that's what we do here at Sage Outcast. We dig, we, we shovel, we shovel well. And if anybody knows that that's from put it down in the comments, I'll give you a hint uh, that the movie ends in the word men. Uh, besides that, I'm going to go ahead and end this one here. You've been listening to Sage Outcast with Sage and the Professor on uh, Subspace Odyssey Radio. I want to thank everybody for swinging in. And listen, we got a lot of other shows we're going to be doing, a lot of different topics. I got one I'm working on. So make sure you follow us here on Subspace Odyssey Radio or find us at Sage Outcast on YouTube. Uh, thanks so much for everybody for swinging in. Um, Sage Outcast. When I was young.